Welcome again, everyone, ladies and gentlemen, back to the Philosophy of Art and Science podcast. Today, our special guest with us is Sofonias Casajon. Before I introduce him, I haven't done uh, enough of the begging that I that I need to be doing. We're 40 episodes in and we have 15 Patreons and I'm very grateful for all of the people that support us on Patreon, but I'm going to be asking for more patrons in an explicit way every time. Of course, it's always in the bio, but now I'm going to throw it in on the front end as well. You can go to patreon.com slash tawahedo, that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash t-e-w-a-h-i-d-o. If you found value, now I know some of you have found value because I've seen the stats and YouTube tells me that you've watched 2,000 hours in the past 30 days alone. So I appreciate you all in the month of August and hopefully we'll keep that same energy going into the Gutes New Year on September 11th. All right, Sofonia, and Devin. Salam no Hinak. How are you? How are you doing? I'm doing well. Xavier Muskan. Glory to God. Whenever we speak in Amharic, you know, we come from a, a very formal culture and a lot of people who are our peers have forgotten this. But I think one of the right. things that that drew Sofonias and I toward each other in the Twitter verse is that <laughs> we have some semblance of desire to look towards and conserve the tradition and, and the values, especially the good things that that we grew up on he he will get into his uh, origin story a little more later but he grew up in the capital city of Addis Ababa now while I grew up in the United States I was raised by people who grew up in the capital city of Addis Ababa and so I think we have uh, an inherent connection there and I think I'll give a general overmap of of how we're going to do things a lot of it is going to be organic and and flow oriented but I said a statement that I think came off as inflammatory to Sophonias, even though I think we agree on far more than we disagree on. And I think it would be very interesting to follow the biblical way of doing things because we both subscribe to the Bible as authoritative in our lives. And so the Bible usually begins with the curse and then ends with the blessing. So I think everyone says something good about you and then they say, but, or nagargan, and it's an afrash. It, it crumbles everything they said before and they end on the negative note. I think we'll begin on what is possibly, if at all, the negative note, and then enter into the positive area, which will be Sophonias' origin story. And he's also a published author of a book that I think is very fascinating. And uh, sadly, is only in Italian now, but I'm sure in the future will be available in other languages and we can at least expound upon it in, in English uh, right now. So to begin with the statement, I made this statement and it's kind of one of those uh, obviously inflammatory things, and it's a, a short quip, but I think it's uh, I think it's on a pretty strong foundation. So my statement was atheism is a Protestant heresy, and we went and we had a few back and forths, and Sophonia said maybe we should associate Protestantism with giving us the best political system, which is representative democracy, the best economic system which is capitalism, and the best work ethic, which is the Protestant work ethic, and the best culture, the Anglo-Saxon one. Now, I understand where a lot of this is um, coming from, but I do think I disagree, at least, at least in some sense, on almost every one of those. So why don't we start off with, with my statement, atheism is a, is a Protestant heresy. What kind of feelings did that statement conjure? And what, if any, disagreement do you have with the with the statement? Well, first of all, Henoch, it's, it's an honor to be this evening. In Rome, it's like 9 o'clock in the evening. And I don't know, I, I know in the West Coast where we are, it's like, I don't know, it's in, in the afternoon. And uh, it's an honor to be with you. Thank you for having me. And, grazie. Uh, grazie, grazie mille. I don't know. We're gonna do this in English, in Italian, in America. We're gonna. We're gonna <laughs> <laughs> in Latin, you speak to me in Latin. I'll speak to you in Gutes. We'll figure it out. <laughs> Classic Greek, and we're gonna go for about it. But uh, thank you so much. It's an honor to be with you. And um, as you said, yeah, um, I started following you on Twitter after you did uh, a video with a uh, with a buddy of mine who lives in Colorado. His name is Itana, and I watched the video, and I was so fascinated by you because uh, you were, you guys were talking about about your upbringings and everything, and. Uh, uh, and you, you touched a lot about, about the religious stuff, the Ethiopian stuff, and you talked about 
you know, growing up in the US and I was fascinated by you. So I started to follow you right away. Just click that button, Twitter, follow you. And after I, I started following you, you made <laughs> that bombastic statement, I may, I may say. <laughs> and they said, process that. That's fair. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and that was, to the, and that's why Twitter it's all about. I mean, it's all it's about to state your mind and uh, you know to 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 say what what you think, uh, what's in your mind. So, and um, you know, and um, I, as you said, you said you 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 posted. You said atheism is a Protestant heresy, and I was about to go. I said um, when I saw it first, I was like. Oh my God! Here we go again. I was like another Ethiopian. We're gonna go that Protestant Orthodox thing. We're gonna do it again. But I started to 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 think about it. What do you Mendalka? I started to reflect on it, and I said, mm, "Well, I mean, I disagree with the with the, the statement that you said, uh, and uh, you know, um, I don't think atheism it's a it's a product it's a product of." Um, even though most most people who become atheists are part of the Protestant culture in the West, and um, uh, they come from that uh, milieu, as you say, no, I, I don't know if I even pronounce that atmosphere, that tradition. Yeah, so it's that, a French word. You know, uh, yeah, English yeah, is a yeah. Franco-Germanic language, and sometimes right. we like to lather those French words in there to make us sound smart. <laughs> exactly, and I said, uh, but I consider myself as a Christian first and foremost. I mean. Uh, uh, and um, I am very near to the Protestant Reformation. I agree with everything that Martin Luther, Martin Luther King did. And uh, and you know, uh, uh, as a Protestant, as a very I have I had to respond. I said, it. <laughs> and I put I put some words in it. And uh, well, I'm gonna. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say it a little bit in America. That's fine. Uh, That's fine. This is a bilingual channel. If yeah, not exactly. multi. Oh. <laughs> awesome. No, when when people say I'm a Protestant, I'm a Catholic, I'm a, I'm an Orthodox. Usually they don't know what those words stand for. I don't know if you have encountered that. Uh, during my days in Addis, I used to witness a lot. I, um, I, I, as a, as a, we were chatting yesterday, uh, I come from a very proud Christian Christian household, and uh, uh, I grew up basically in church. I was uh, I was born again Christian since when I was like ten, and from the age of thirteen till now, I have read the Bible every night, and I have, I have prayed every night. So. I have some uh, bias in this. Um, <laughs> I have uh, I have my my own group. Let's say I have my own my own camp. Um, and again, Orthodox, Catholic, Protestant, I mean, more than the word they say. Um, and if focus marag mafelgo, so what you mean to no miyam no temilo well, I became Orthodox because my parents are Orthodox, and you know, um, I just <laughs> engulfed, engulfed on the street when we look at that. Like an inheritance. Uh, like an inheritance. And, uh, and faith is not something you inherit from your parents. It's something very, it's very deep than, uh, than the cultural asset that their, your parents give you. And now, uh, I, I'll, I'll give you a little, a little pushback yeah. on that. Uh, and yeah. I'll let you. I'll let you continue. But I want you to think about when you say that statement, the yeah. role of Lois and Eunice, the mother and grandmother of Timothy, mm. and mm. how they, yeah, their faith, which was Judaism, to Timothy, exactly. which allowed exactly. him to have a fuller <clears throat> understanding of Christianity as he receives Christianity. Exactly. Yeah. Um, the Apostle Paul also talks uh, talks a lot about it in his in his epistle to to Timothy. Uh, yeah, I mean, there is. I became a Christian because my my family was Christian at first, but when I was like 13, 14, I decided to become a Christian, not because yes. my parents were Christians, but it was a personal decision I made, you know. And most people, I think, especially in our age, they don't make that decision. They just inherited it, 
and Zimbalo um, Mangalega Walu, and most of them you see they're not committed then, and they large them. There's there's not that fire inside you that you know that drives you every day. Uh, and I, I'm more about I don't care about the label. That was my point I was about to make. I don't care about what it, what you call yourself a Protestant, a Catholic, an Orthodox, uh, or a Presbyterian, Baptist, Mnamen. But I'm more concerned about what you believe. What you believe. When people say when I when I say when I'm a when I say I'm a Christian, what do I think about that? That is my more focus. So people say I'm a Protestant, I'm an Orthodox, I'm a Catholic, and Mnamen, Mnamen. Again, at the end of the day. It's not the label. It's uh, it's uh, what undergirds is what you believe, what you have at the base. What is your your belief? And uh, and most people sadly uh, today they don't have that biblical root. So, um, sorry to say that. I, I would I would agree with that statement. I have yeah. heard Ethiopian Orthodox. So again, I have a bias, right? So my bias is I'm not just an Orthodox Christian. I was ordained into the diaconate in the, in the Orthodox Christian church. So I'm very biased, more biased than, than most people. But what, what may surprise you, or I don't know if you've seen it from the general, we could say the milieu of my channel is yeah. that I am arguably, if not the most, one of the most ecumenical Christians possible. Mm -hmm. What I don't do is I don't extend this ecumenism into uh, falsehood. So what what I'll say is I, I've come across people who self-identify as Ethiopian Orthodox Christians who believe yeah. that the Catholic Church doesn't believe in the Trinity. And, yeah. you know, I mean, it's just it's it's stupid. Exactly. But, I mean, it's not even a misunderstanding. In yeah. 2020, it's unforgivable. You know, <laughs> it's, a, it's a, what they would call in the Catholic Church a mortal sin. You know, <laughs> you know, if you have access to the internet, I'm not saying the 80 year old grandmother in the Ethiopian countryside. If you yeah. live in Addis Ababa, or if yeah. you live in Rome, or if you live in Los Angeles, and yeah. you make a statement like that, it is to me, uh, you have to know the, the, the tree by its fruit. It is exactly. to me, an example of illiteracy. Exactly. And if not, you know, if not illiteracy in a literal sense, functional illiteracy, right? It says in the scroll of Isaiah, there's the person who has the book open, but and they know how to read it, but they don't. And then the person who, who has the book closed, and there's no difference between the two. Exactly. So for me, it's it's action oriented. I like that you use the word belief. Yeah. And that you're judging people on their ideas. What yeah, I would right. like to push forward is beyond ideas, because we see in Matthew seven, he yeah. says, "Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom." Right. For me, right. beyond just the confession element. And I think inherently and inextricably linked is the the action. You you the have fact. to be able to see yes. You have to see the response exactly. to the the gift of salvation of of love exactly. of God exactly. and love of the neighbor in action. Exactly. exactly. And Jesus said the same thing in the in the Gospel of John. He said, "If you love me," he didn't say, "Keep singing for me." You know, keep. <laughs> if you love me, he said, "Keep my commandments." Amen. I want your actions if you love me you said you know keep my commandments and <laughs> the commandments i gave you and it's the same thing in a, in a in a marriage if you love your wife you know it does it's not only because you 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 take her out once in a while you buy her gifts you shower and everything but it has to be proven by your facts like you're gonna keep um, fidelity and everything that comes you know then there's a, a whole bag of things to unpack it says it's not only going to church on sundays and living like you know <laughs> like an animal during the weekdays i mean if you love me say jesus keep my commandments so uh, that's what that's what i mean when you um, when i when i said before that uh, i'm more concerned with people's action and belief and what what they say than the than the label they say uh, the we, we agree there we agree there so exactly. what what i what i think i heard you doing although you didn't do this in explicitly the same way perhaps yeah. you did this in the italian way which is different than the <laughs> the protestants i've encountered here is yeah. there's this game that's played i'll show you as an example i worked in latino neighborhoods in mm. los angeles where you see the big divide you know, for all intents and purposes, most of them are Christian. But you see yeah. this in Latino communities in the United States, but you also see this in Ethiopian communities. I've seen it in Ethiopia and I've seen it here in Los Angeles. So yeah. in the Latino communities, 
the kids, the children who are very impressionable and they get it from their teachers. They're getting it from somebody. They say, are you Christian or are you Catholic? In the Ethiopian setting, I hear them say, Christianish, waste orthodox. (laughs) And for me, it's the most deeply offensive and insulting thing. And it belies, I think, what you said, this misunderstanding. And I think the the label Protestant, almost never do you hear someone who fits the description Protestant want to accept that label. Because the original, you mentioned Martin Luther earlier. The original, I went to a Lutheran middle school. The original 95 theses, which I studied from a very young age. Uh, Again, I was was going to the Protestant chapel every week uh, during my middle school period for three years. So that whole reformation or protest with Zingwilly, with Calvin, with Luther, the main idea was to reform or change the Catholic church 500 years later. Yeah, exactly. 500 years later, um, the Catholic Church has made some reforms and made some concessions, I think, in response to the Reformation. But I don't yeah. I, I don't think there's an en masse sort of return. So I think it's yeah. kind of I've heard some people say reformed and always reforming so that yeah. there is no you know stated end. And yeah. I, I've seen the move be to say that I am a non-denominational Christian. That's yeah. what I've heard people. I didn't hear you use that language, but I heard you yeah. use similar language to say, you know, neutral Christianity, I would propose that you can be multi-denominational, but I think it is actually impossible to be non-denominational. And the reason I say that is on certain key factors, like you mentioned, you will have beliefs and you will have actions in accordance. For example, even the very structure of how you meet and gather, what is the role of the pulpit? What is the role of the Eucharist or the communion? Do you believe in a priesthood beyond the priesthood of believers, meaning the structure of governance. Do you have elders, bishops, priests, deacons? Um, do you you have high church or low church? You know the difference mm-hmm. between Anglicans and Quakers is Anglicans yeah. use incense, Quakers do not. Yeah. Anglicans will say God is mother and father. Uh, excuse me, Quakers might say God is mother and father. Anglicans are just going to use father things like that so where yeah. where do you kind of fall on these high church low church but like uh, do you like incense do you think it's uh you know it's haram or is it is it like however each parish decides how often mm. do you take communion what do you think of the priesthood um mm. do you ever use holy oil what do you think of that is it you know should it not be used should it be used? these types of things i imagine you have positions on these yeah, things. exactly no so all my all my positions are what that they are taught they are underlined on the bible so i i start from that we don't um, so the main uh, the main thing that attracted me to the protestant side the protestant side of the christianity is um sola scriptura uh, as in the latin only the word of god should matter so as a protestant christian i say um, unlike the Catholics, that they have the Pope that is, decides, and uh, you know the Pope is above the, is the pastor of the of the whole church, and uh, he's infallible and everything. We don't we don't believe that as a Christians, as a Protestant Christians, we only believe in sola scriptura, like um, the Word of God is what guides us, is the ultimate uh, uh, faith giver. I mean, the uh, the ultimate judge between us. Uh, is the word of God. So everything that the word of God says, for me, it's okay. So if the word of God, yeah, um, yeah so I, I understand. Me. Yeah, I, I grew up, I grew up around again, that's Pro- that setting Christian. or that, yeah. that context. Obviously, yeah. as an Orthodox Christian, I do not believe in sola scriptura. But what yeah. I think you may find interesting is the Orthodox expression is yeah. that scripture yeah. and the formation of scripture is a yeah. part of the holy tradition. The holy writ or the holy mm. scriptures or the sacred scriptures, however you want to refer, is a part yeah. of the holy tradition. And okay. it is the height or the malekia. It is mm. that which we use to measure mm. the rest of tradition. If something does not comport with it, then mm. we have to get rid of it. It has to be measured with that. And it goes back to the first 300 years of Christianity. All yeah. they had was the Old Testament. You see Peter and all the apostles, the way that they preach Stephen, when they preach in the New Testament, they exclusively use the Old Testament because the New Testament 
doesn't get canonized until centuries later under Athanasius mm -hmm. of Alexandria, who's in the Coptic mm -hmm. lineage, the, the kind of the throne or the see of Mark from which the Ethiopian uh, bishopry originates. Yeah. And so yeah. I, I don't want to delve down into that type of debate because, frankly, people just have to examine <laughs> those you know, church history and, and make those decisions themselves. I'm far more interested in, for example, simply teaching the Bible and teaching it, you know, from this perspective and letting, mm -hmm. letting folks go where they may, yeah. you, you may have seen one of the commenters actually yeah. on, on our thread there was a friend of yeah. mine, Nate, who studied the Orthodox church for a while. He grew up yeah. Baptist and he actually converted to the black wow. Catholic tradition in the okay. United States. I saw, I saw, yeah, I liked it. Yeah, I, I, I saw that video. The black, the black Catholicism. Uh, yeah, the title was Black Catholicism uh, in the U.S. and something like that. And I yes. really enjoyed that. So he was a Protestant Baptist before, and then yes. he converted to Catholicism. Up until I mean, about a year or two ago. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I don't care about the labels, as I told you before. Yeah. What I, what I, what I, what I really care is what is your belief system? What is your belief? system structured in what is your belief system rooted in because when you um in the in the early days of the church uh I, i'm pro i'm 100 100 sure you you studied church history and, and you know more than that because you're you're a deacon in the orthodox church but when you when you go back to the days of paul and peter and uh, and the, the the first church that was set up in uh in, in the area of mesopotamia and in rome there was no labels of Catholic, Protestant, Orthodoxy. And these things became more, more, more mainstream because they they were used as a tool, I think, by the political authority to govern people. Because in Europe during the Middle Ages, you know, the church had had a huge role uh, in the in the in the state in the aspect of the political in the political aspect of the of the of the in state. Ethiopia as well. In Ethiopia as well, and I'm very grateful for the Judeo-Christian tradition we have in Ethiopia and the Judeo-Christian tradition we have in the West, because most of the laws, most of the freedoms that we enjoy today, developed from the church. They come from Christianity, and I'm so, so I'm so grateful for that. So, by the way, I love the Orthodox Church in Ethiopia. I'm not one of those kind of Protestants that say they don't. I mean, I love I love Orthodox Catholics. I mean, Christian brothers. Even though we, we we don't we may have some disagreement on the ideology, I mean, at the end of the day, we're still brothers and sisters in Christ. So that is like the 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 line for me. So I love the Orthodox Church, even though I don't I don't agree with some of its uh, with some of its practices. But to to go back to to my point, as I said. When you, I mean, I'm currently in Rome, and when you are in Rome, you, you really see the Middle Ages. It's fascinating when you go to the Vatican and when you see Rome, the, the whole history behind it. I mean, it's really fascinating. And most of these institutions, like the Catholic Church, the Orthodox Church, the Protestant Church, I mean, the Anglo, the Anglo Saxon culture developed from the Protestant from the Protestant tradition of Christianity because in the upper in the upper mid in the upper in the north europe like in england and most of the northern european countries are protestant countries because it was in the middle ages but like I say, in the middle ages you know um the church is to to rule there was no political authority there was no government the church was the the essential power of the of the of the state so people to to have influence in the sense of the of the day, you know, in, in, to our political influence, they use they use the church at the end of the day. When you see the revolution that happened in Henry VIII, uh, when they threw the Catholic king and then restated the Protestant king in England, when uh, when you see the the fight that was between the, the which Catholic was Catholic, right? So England Catholic. was Catholic until that point, exactly. and, and this is cent centuries after the Magna Carta, which is one of the most foundational texts of the Anglo-Saxon culture. So you exactly. can't give it all to Protestantism, Pro but certainly the latter half of the Anglo tradition is exactly. uh, from the Anglican, which itself, you know, many low later generations of Protestants would consider no different than the Catholic Church when they look at. At that, like I, I would wonder if you feel more comfortable in an Anglican church 
or if you mm -hmm. would feel more comfortable in like an American Baptist or a Presbyterian, I would be curious about that. I, I, I would feel at home in American Baptist church. I mean, I, I watch, especially in those African American Baptist churches where there's the shouting and everything, the drum. I mean, I would, I would really feel at home in those places. But to, my, to go to my point, I just like in Europe, when, when you study church history, especially in Europe, where these institutions developed, and uh, then I mean, there were there were like politically influenced institutions. There were not people that were not like basing their beliefs on the Bible. They wanted to to have political power, so they used the main thing they have on their hand, which was religion. So, at the end of the day, when you say Protestant, Protestant or Catholic or Orthodox, as I, as I told you, I, that's why I told you I don't care about the labels because at the end of the day. I want to know what you believe in. Because when you go to Ethiopia, people say, I'm an Orthodox. And they say, I have also a friend here, uh, a very dear friend. He says he's an Orthodox. And I ask him, what, what, what are the Orthodox doctrine? And he didn't have a clue. <laughs> I mean, yeah, he, and that, and that's, that's a big difference, right? Is the, yeah. the key. So the, the dogmatic position in Protestantism yeah, exactly. of sola scriptura means that each individual person is yeah. where the authority rests. And so the underlying assumption is that every single individual must be yeah. responsible for being mm -hmm. able to explicate the entirety of the gospel message. Whereas in the Orthodox Church, as an example, I won't be defending the Catholic Church today, uh, in the Orthodox Church, we've always yeah. had something called Tirgwame Wemesaift. And mm. Tirigwame Mosaift, as well as the Likaw and Kubai, are yeah. the group of sages who've understood the interpretation of the school of interpretation and scriptures from yeah. the kind of formal founding of the church in the 300s to the yeah. present day, with huge yeah. influence from Antioch in the Syriac community, as well as uh, Alexandria and the Coptic yeah. community, as well as our own kind of indigenous productions of the Andimta tradition yeah. or the interpretation tradition. And so the yeah. expectation is that there would always be a group of elites who are responsible mm -hmm. with spreading that message. Mm -hmm. And the the faithful have a role to play. But mm -hmm. I think the expectation of every single individual being able to explicate every, you know, nitty gritty detail, I think is a bit unreasonable because there always seems to be elites and the masses in any society yeah. that we've ever seen. And so yeah. I think that the elites have always done a good mm -hmm. job. For example, when Jesuit priests accused the church of Judaism in the 1500s, yeah. Emperor yeah. Galadios gathered yeah. the people. Emperor Galadios himself probably would not be able to explain his faith in the nitty gritty, although he had big picture ideas, but yeah. he gathered the elites to do that. But there's a sort of folk wisdom that, for example, my grandmother, she passed away about a year ago now, September will be a year. She, mm. she wasn't one of the leak Awans. She's not one of the sages, but she yeah. would be able to quote from me the Psalms of David and yeah. the book of Job. The, now, the Psalms of David, she actually read. The yeah. book of Job is more incredible to me because she would quote it to me in Giz, and I know she didn't have it. So it shows <laughs> me that the kind of idiomatic expression, the way that the KJV is lathered in the English language and the Anglo-Saxon culture, the, yeah. the Giz and the Amharic, the, the sayings and the aphorisms – are, are lathered in in biblical wisdom. Now, yeah. doesn't mean all of them are right. There is this deep neftanya or gun <laughs> culture, which yeah. is in tension. The same way as in some Protestant circles, in the United States, there's some yeah. tension when people say God, golden country. Uh, exactly. There's some there's some tension going on between these things. But let, yeah. let's not get too bogged down in this because we could have yeah. a whole another episode on this. <laughs> let's focus on the atheism. And so the atheism. atheism. Yeah is a Protestant heresy. Now, mm. Protestantism yeah. has tens of thousands of various denominations. Now, yeah. I, would, I would submit to you that you probably agree with maybe three to five of them, but I'm sure yeah. there are plenty or not because from this, you get yeah. Mormonism. You know, that's yeah. where it comes from, from Adam Smith in the United States. From yeah. this, you have what uh, our former prime minister HD was, the Sableo Sawian, the Jesus yeah. only group who don't believe in the Trinity. Yeah, exactly. So I know there's no way you agree with all of them. Yeah, all I was saying is 
you have people who are the deists, like the founding fathers, people like Thomas Jefferson who want to rip out the miracles of the Bible and say, this is the Thomas Jefferson Bible. People yeah. like Lincoln, who I think would would be like who you described, using biblical words and KJV language for power acquisition, more so than you know trying to be a real missionary for for the good news. And you have all these various. Yeah. No, because I said most of the founding fathers they own slaves. So I yes, mean, were... <laughs> yes. <laughs> there's a hypocrisy. So there's a hypocrisy there. Exactly. culture is tied to a religion sometimes people think culture is not tied everything is tied to a religion yeah. and it's not until the enlightenment and mm -hmm. later you know nietzscheanism and later mm -hmm. uh, secular humanism and later postmodernism, yeah. these these kind of main ideas that yeah. atheism really starts to spread until today you have the new atheists people like richard dawkins people like lawrence krauss the physicist like all, all these people who are yeah. evangelists of atheism and the bombastic point, as you said, that I'm trying yeah. to make is yeah. that I find it interesting that mm -hmm. that is their cultural milieu. Does that mean yeah. that every sect of Protestantism is wrong inherently? No, but I think it makes you makes you consider that point. And I'm wondering if if now you would agree that it's at least the, the milieu, because the most atheist person that has ever existed in Ethiopian history has yeah. been the philosopher Zeray Aikob or what. Yeah. And even mm -hmm. if you read his story, what's so fascinating is he prays by himself in a cave, the Psalms of David. He's not mm -hmm. comfortable with the Gospels. He's not comfortable with Genesis, all these other narratives. The it's very strange. <laughs> he still believes in some sort of deism. Yeah. And he still prays to God through the full range of human emotions we find in the Psalms of David. And so that, that's the only point that is the most atheistic, organic Ethiopian tradition you could find is itself mm -hmm. still some form of deism. And mm -hmm. itself, he's influenced by the Portuguese who start raising some questions to him and whom he's in dialogue with and with Emperor Susnios at the time. Yeah. So that's the only point I was trying to make. Yeah, so I'm wondering I'm gonna, if that is still too inflammatory for you to sign on to or you could sign on. <laughs> inflammatory, but I'm going to push back on that. because I, and, and you remember on Twitter, I responded to you. I said, maybe be, people became atheists, not because they grew up in a Protestant tradition culture, uh, but maybe they're using their f their free will to exercise to exercise what they think. I mean, oh, now they, yeah, nowadays when you when you when you see young people in Ethiopia, especially, they grew up in a in an Orthodox world, church in an Orthodox uh, culture. But most young people in Ethiopia today are becoming atheists, and is that because the Orthodoxy is a um, um, it's a uh, it's uh, it's atheism is harassed. It's because they it's it because they grew up in that orthodox culture that became atheist. No, I don't think so. It's the it's the culture that they have been influenced. It's the Western so, culture. So, yeah. You and I hundred percent agree yeah. on individuals. And so this is also again a big a big difference between Protestantism and orthodoxy, which I think is showing up in our discussion. Yeah. So you and I hundred percent. There's no disagreement on yeah, exactly. individuals. What I'm yeah. arguing about are the material and yeah. the immaterial factors of the system and the culture in um, which atheism yeah. as an idea formed. Yeah. And what I'm saying is nothing about atheism is yeah. Ethiopian. There's nothing Ethiopian about atheism. It is yeah. wholly a Western construction. And within that, a construction yeah. of people who, mm -hmm. whose background were Protestants. So what I mean is, when we look at, for example, the Democrat Party, whom yeah. I think you and I both critique a lot, exactly. what we no, see I'm is a talking. secular humanism that yeah. is, it, it, it uses Protestant language, but it is yeah. given up on Protestantism. Some of them still claim to be Protestants, but frankly, I don't believe them. And if you ask them whether or not, you know, Jesus rose from the dead, I'm sure they'll tell you it's symbolic or something like that. Uh, you know, I think people like Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama are, uh, and Joe Biden even, who is himself Catholic, uh, mm -hmm. allegedly. I, I think these people are more interested in fulfillment of their philosophy through politics, through the political means, than, yeah. than through the spiritual means. And I think that these yeah. are people who are clearly in the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant tradition. And I exactly. think when secularism keeps going forward, 
it goes yeah. into postmodernism and then into nihilism, which is, yeah. I think, the truest expression of atheism. And that's what I'm trying to talk about on a systemic level. On individuals, you and I are 100% agreement. Exactly. So if you agree on the individual level, so we agree that um, individuals are created by the creator and they are endowed, you know, by the creator, by God, to have a free will. So they have, they have, they're free to choose. So when people yes. become atheists, I respect that. I mean, I have no problem. But as you said, if you if you're going to talk about the culture and the um, uh, the atmosphere in which people grew up, uh, I mean, if you look at and I mean, it's, it's a given fact uh, that most of the westernized world, what most of the modern world side of the world, which is the western part of the world, are um, the freest, the more freest. Uh, um, so, uh, d define freedom for us because freedom means a lot of different things for a lot of different people and and actually some of the some of the terms you used i think yeah. it may it, it may come off as semantics but i think that there's some deep exploration of the of some of the terms you, you that you use that are common in uh, american conservative um parlance and i think we have some big things we do agree on but i think yeah. i would use some terms differently so tell me yeah. what you mean by freedom and and i'll try to see if i need to complicate it and just to, to pass on I'm a, I'm a conservative republican side so i have my bias on that side too. so i love american conservatism so freedom for me is the ability to do whatever you want whatever you want in, in your life as far as you don't you don't um uh you don't you don't Go, you don't super the line. You don't go. You don't go touch other people's rights. So it's the ability to think, do, say whatever you want, as long as you you, you still respect the the rights of other people. So the the line, the premises is the rights of the other people. When you you have the right to you know uh, to to swallow your fist, your your fist, as long as I don't touch your face. It's like a John Stuart Mill, John Stuart Mill tradition. I understand freedom in that way, uh, in the libertarian, in the, the libertarian tradition. As long as I don't, uh, I don't, I don't touch you. I don't, uh, I don't have any negative impact on you or on your rights. I'm free to do whatever I want. So, I I respect people's freedom, as, uh, like to choose to choose the lifestyle they uh, they want to engage in. Uh, uh, as long as they respect other people's rights. So that is what freedom for me. So the most free societies in the world are found in the Western part, in the Western societies, in the Western part of the world. I mean, that is a fact. And most of the Western, 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 Western nations have a Protestant, that Anglo-Saxon Protestant traditions. I mean, that is also a fact. They're not Catholic, they're not Orthodox. They are, most of them, they are a Protestant culture tradition. At the base, they have the- Well, the French, if you're talking about, if we look at the kind of major players in the world, yeah. right? Yeah. We think of Russia, China, France, Germany, the UK, and the United States. Now, I think the UK and the United States fit the description yeah. that you say yeah. but again yeah. i want to mention that the magna carta comes around while england is catholic so don't don't forget that aspect and then if yeah. you're talking about france and germany those are certainly uh, catholic areas although germany yeah. has had a lot of protestants and is the home of martin luther yeah germany is a protestant but i don't consider russia and china to be a superpower so, i mean they're not three nations free societies okay well, hold on hold on hold on, hold on. <laughs> they are for sure superpowers. Are they free or not? That is a different question. So now I want to talk about freedom and explore it. I, yeah. by the way, generally agree with how you described freedom. But yeah. I think where I differ from a lot of American conservatives is in my priorities. Yeah. And my priorities really have not changed over the years. My politics and economics have changed. My yeah. economics is probably where I would agree with you the, the, the most. I think the way yeah. I define economics and politics is like economics describes the situation it's descriptivist and politics is what you want to prescribe or what you want to say should be in the world so for me freedom i follow what your rule is saying but for me for example 
the United States imprisons more people than anyone else on earth. There are about 3 million people, which is the size of a small country, who are incarcerated yeah. in the United States. That's domestically. Actually, what I should have mentioned first, what I prioritize above that, is that yeah. the military budget of the United States is around $500 billion. It's It's around more than what yeah. the whole world combined, including Russia and China, who are yeah. the next superpowers, spend yeah. on that. And we have enough nuclear weapons to threaten to destroy the world over 10 times. And the harm that is caused with the tens of thousands of innocent people who have been drone striked and bombed and extrajudiciously killed, to yeah. me, means that the United States federal government, both foreign, like abroad and domestically, has mm. actually spread the opposite of freedom, what you would could call enslavement and even death and destruction, more so mm. than any other regime that has ever existed. At the same time, paradoxically, mm. there are certainly these elements of freedom that you talk about, and that's yeah. why I'm here. And so you use the word capitalism on Twitter. Yeah. And so yeah. I wanna I wanna break that down too, because it's one of those controversial words. If we, you know, the original author of the word capitalism is Marx. Yeah. And exactly. so Marx is referring to the status quo. Now, mm -hmm. for me, there are three main types of systems that you could really have in the modern world. It's yeah. a fully socialist system where all the means of production are nationalized. It's mm -hmm. a fully free market system where everything is not nationalized. It's decentralized, depoliticized. And then mm -hmm. it's an interventionist economy where it's a mix of the two. Frankly, yeah, exactly. the status quo is a mix of the two. We could talk about so many factors and areas of the economy where the, yeah. the government sticks its mitts where you and I would like them to take it out. Where I think you and I would agree, you know, easily is corn subsidies and it's kind of silly things like that, where I think yeah. it's the same. But I, I would like to think, you know, do you critique the United States empire? Do you apply this sort of don't harm libertarian principle to, yeah. for example, hard drugs like heroin and cocaine? Yeah. Uh, well, I think the U.S. is a for me. It's a it's a force for good in the world. I have that kind of philosophy. I don't see it as an as an empire or uh, as a. Um, I mean, I, I see the U.S. as a beacon of freedom in the world, as the as the shining city on the hills. That is that is my 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 vision of America. That is my vision of its policies and, of what it uh, is. Right, not what it should be, but what it is. Actually, what it is, I see the U.S. as a as a force for good in the world. Now we may disagree on that point because you have you have grown up in LA, you have uh, you were born and raised in LA, and I think you have you have another another point of view. But I see America as a force for good in the world. That is that is my that is my that is my position. But um, just to um, to uh, re what was the other question you asked me? So, for example, yeah. we're, 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 we're defining freedom. And the reason we're defining freedom is we talked about the cultural milieu in which atheism was produced. And one of the arguments you're trying to say is, yes, that atheism, uh, you can agree on a systemic, not an individual level, but on a systemic level, these cultures produced atheism. But then you all yeah. want to say that they also produce the freest societies ever. And I say we have to put a question mark while I value a lot of the things in those free societies. And as far as voting with my feet, I was born here, raised here, and I continue to live here. It's not that I've moved away, although I've yeah. certainly considered that and would long term like to, if, yeah. if possible, move back to Ethiopia, actually. And I say move yeah. back. I've never lived there. I've only visited and I've visited many times. But yeah. um, I think on an index factor, there mm -hmm. are certain things that we have to account for. For example, yeah. Russia and China, Hong Kong and Singapore. I mm -hmm. think in terms of the economy yeah. are producing certain levels of freedom, especially yeah. Hong Kong and Singapore, that yeah. are not being seen in the United States. At the same time, in terms of civil liberties, you can get beaten for chewing gum. You can get put to death for smoking marijuana or cannabis, mm -hmm. uh, which you know is uh, very antithetical to California's uh, kind of thought process yeah. exactly. and so in, in those areas of freedom those places i just mentioned in the east are yeah. certainly lacking but in terms of having caused way less harm abroad which for me do no harm is kind of one of the most yeah. basic principles 
yeah. think the United States again is is more guilty as a regime than mm. any other regime on the face of the planet right now. The only one that could compete with it is in mm. its heyday when the sun could not set on the British Empire. And so <laughs> when when you talk about again harm caused to other people, innocence mm. blown up, that, mm -hmm. that to me is not freedom. And it is the same level of hypocrisy that you pointed out in the founding fathers. When I read the founding fathers, yeah. I have to acknowledge the elephant in the room of slavery. At the mm -hmm. same time, I have to acknowledge mm -hmm. the erudition, the scholarliness, the brilliance mm -hmm. and the, the mm -hmm. writings that they, they produced. Yeah. And I think those things are intention, but I do think right. that those things both exist. Yeah, but it's also, it's also um, a little bit funny and a little bit, because I see these protests going on in the US with Black Lives Matter and, you know, to where is the past, we need a new, um, a new starting point. But it's also a little bit, how, how can I put it this way? Quote unquote, hypocritical to judge people that were, that lived in the 16th, 17th century, 18th century, and judge them from a point of view, from a point of view in a society, in the free society we live today, from from a point of view of the 21st century, I don't know. We live in the 21st century, which is the the freest uh, the freest century in the history of the world, the most um, prosperous prosperous time in the in the history of the world, uh, yeah. where the rights are respected. And it's a little bit, a little bit, I say, hypocritical to go back and to judge people with the same exact standards we have today. People that lived in the 16th and 17th century. So uh, I, I, I agree with that point for most people, because yeah. I think the key principle is that you're yeah. allowed to do that if you yeah. hold ideas which are yeah. not palatable to your mm -hmm. context, your setting and your time. But because the, the people who say that they would fight yeah. alongside the abolitionists now, a lot of yeah. them are lying. So I, I think, get, for example, though, Thomas Jefferson yeah. wrote about freeing slaves in his yeah. private letters. Yeah. but in his public actions did yeah. not have the courage and temerity to actually mm -hmm. free his slaves and mm -hmm. actually you know raped people like Sa Sally Hemings and was mm -hmm. very hypocritical at the same time he provided he provided very beautiful documents that were mm -hmm. necessary to the founding of America so i think exactly. it is fair to judge him on those grounds especially yeah. for the type of people that yeah. hold controversial opinions. So I would I would like to ask you, you know, you live in Italy. If you yeah. lived in America, I wonder what yeah. in in amongst the Republicans, what yeah. do you think would be your most controversial point of view? Because I think if people don't have any sort of views that push against the people that are around them, then yeah. we would not be able to judge people in history because we would exactly. be just like them. Exactly. So before I respond, that's a great question, and I have a, a, a good a good answer for that. But just to say, most of the people who judge the founding fathers today, today that live in the 21st century, they live today, and they say they are pro abortion, uh, that they want to abolish slavery in the 16th and the 17th century, are pro choice and pro abortion today, today, today they are they are marching. For the for the clean for the killing from the unborn, so it's it's a little bit. Of, you see the hypocrisy where it comes. Today, the most controversial uh, the most controversial position you can you can you can be in is to be a pro life. Is a it's someone to be it's an individual to, to be a pro life, and the same people that will point their fingers at the founding fathers because they kept they had slaves and they uh, they did such and such and such things. They are the most pro-abortion people today. So the hypocrisy, it's a little bit... I, I, I would agree with you on the Democrat side, which is why the most fascinating people are the Southern Democrats. For example, his, yeah. his name is slipping me now, but again, with my friend Nate, who's a black Catholic, he lives in Louisiana. We got to keep them in our prayers because they're experiencing Hurricane Laura yeah. right now. But the governor of Louisiana is a pro-life yeah. Democrat. And so, for example, because he's in the Democrat party, but he's pro-life, I would say that he's courageous. At the same time, I would point to people like Justin Amash, although he's changed now, he was in the Republican Party, Thomas mm -hmm. Massey, people like Rand Paul and people like Ron Paul on the Republican side because they were mm -hmm. anti-war. They were against the wars of Bush yeah. and they were against yeah. the wars of Obama and they're against the wars of Trump. Um, 
And exactly. so I think that the courageous people on the Republican side are those who are anti-war and the courageous people on the Democrat side are those who are pro-life because I think together that's a consistent life position. And I think both people are going against the grain of the people yeah. in their milieu or context or setting. Exactly. But then I'm going to have to ask you because I, it's been a while since I've spoken English. I live in Rome and every day I speak Italian and French and Latin. Non c'è problema. <laughs> Awesome. No c'è nessun problema because if you did if we did it in Italian, it was it would it would have come flop. But uh uh thank you for that. Just apologize. I'm gonna have to apologize for that. If I'm yeah, no, done. we're gonna we're gonna pause here and tell everyone Sophonias speaks yeah. Amharic, English, Italian, uh what French. else? French, French, Latin, Greek. So he has multiple languages running through his head, and I give him all the credit for not only having Twitter fingers like a lot of people, but coming yeah. on to this podcast, coming in with me and speaking in English, which although Amharic is my first language too, I was yeah. raised in the United States. And so English, uh, you know, English comes very easy to me. I have some, some languages running through my head, which they've seen me go through yeah. as well. But yeah, at any moment, if you want to go into Amharic or throw and some Italian in and maybe I'll try to respond in Spanish. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because no, no, because living in here in here in Italy, nobody like nobody speaks English. So every day, now it's now it's been like six, seven years since I since I started to live here, and I've picked up not only the Italian but the Roman side of the of the how they speak the slang, you know, the slang of the the Italian side. So English has been I have I haven't spoken English in a, in a bit of a while. So that's why. Bezna, Arago Bezna, tau. I told him, I told him on the phone, Sophonia speaks better English than some Ethiopians who've lived in the United States for 20 years. So that's for their shame and that's kudos to Sophonia's. Thank you for that. So as, uh, so my point is, you know, so I, I just wanted to, um, to, 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 to call out the hypocrisy on the people that they judge the founding fathers today and they are they couldn't take even the most rational position on abortion and they you know they point their fingers uh, on the fallen fathers i mean it's not that they didn't have any sin the fallen fathers did the 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 americans call it the original sin of america you know the 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 creative sin but they also fought like a civil war to end slavery i mean that is all these things all these um i mean america fought a civil war to end slavery. I mean, that is for me. It's a, uh, it's a consequential act uh, 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 that they did. And I was like, and I took part. And uh, you know, as a conservative, I spoke with Dennis Prager, and uh, I'm a very huge Prager U fan. I'm and uh, I'm also an ambassador to their program. And I was I was also reading some some books on uh, the, that some historians wrote, and they were like analyzing. Why is it? Where did these uh, ideas come uh, of to end slavery, to hold every individual equal in their dignity, and to see everyone as equal in their God-given rights? Because the because America and the West were founded on Judeo-Christian values, uh, and those Judeo-Christian values uh, were able to develop the most that the, um, they were able to. To, to develop and to maximize their, uh, um, uh, they were able to maximize their their profit, to, you know, from from the values to maximize their profit. It was because they were um, in a Protestant tradition. I mean, uh, in the um, how can I say this? Um, I understand where you're coming from. The, if they did not have the Judeo-Christian, I wouldn't say Protestant tradition, but if they didn't have the Judeo-Christian tradition, the it, Christian. maybe maybe they would have never gotten rid yeah. of slavery because in non-Judeo-Christian societies, for yeah, example, yeah. you see cannibalism, you see human sacrifice, you see right. um, uh, people not just uh, like abortion is common now 
in a certain yeah. sense, as technology advances, we may see yeah. people aborting people selectively because they may have Down syndrome and other things. And from an, a secular ethic, there's no yeah. reason not to make that sort of utilitarian decision. Yeah. And I, I would yeah. agree with you on most of those things. However, yeah. in the UK, where it's also Protestant, they did so yeah. without a civil war, without 500, 600,000 lives being lost. And like yeah. I said, without Lincoln's kind of bloodlust for maintaining the union. Remember, the yeah. Abe Lincoln, says if yeah. I can preserve the union with slavery, I will do so. If I can do it without slavery, I will do so. His number one impetus was not the gospel of Jesus Christ, was not yeah. ending slavery, but was collecting the Southern tax money and keeping the union as one entity so that he could lord over it. And in the UK, they got rid of it without a civil war. In Ethiopia, which is an Orthodox country, although it mm -hmm. took longer, they also mm -hmm. got rid of slavery without mm -hmm. a civil war. Yeah. You see, now I didn't take Ethiopian history one on one. And that and when people told me here in Italy, some of the fascists, I have, I have encountered some fascists and they. Real they're, fascists. They're, oh my God. <laughs> they're, they're real fascists. And because I'm a journalist, I had an opportunity to go there and interview them. And their main excuse was willing to Ethiopia to abolish slavery. And because I was I was brought up in this European European school, you know, it's a, it's a European Italian school. I never took like Ethiopian history one hundred and one. And I as to to this day, to still to this day, it's very hard for me to to grasp the idea that in Ethiopia we have slavery. And I had to go and um, do a little bit of research and found out it was in the Emperor's time that was uh, that was. Uh, abolished uh, the, the, yes. the slave was abolished so yeah there are the, yeah by the way there are real and it's things. different uh, yeah and it's different it's very it's different. different than the american system it's not yeah. the chattel slavery and in fact to this day an yeah. impolite truth is yeah. that yeah. to an extent when you see the house servants uh, including yeah. the male and female servants the zebenya who's the security guard and the saratenya yeah who is the, the woman servant usually who washes cl clothes by hand and, and prepares and cleans food. You know, a lot of times I think you will find a lot of genetic crossover between those groups. And that's one of those realities that Ethiopia needs to continue to deal with. And it is inequity and it does need to be deal dealt with, but it is, it is also very different from uh, the system because oftentimes those people would intermarry with the ruling class. So exactly. for example, you have people like Menelik where his, his mother, you know, is, is one of those slaves, which, which one of the, the American presidents has like a mother who was a slave. You know what I mean? You, you don't, you don't, you don't see that sort of, um, exactly. there is still a colorism, but the colorism is different and the class mobility through, uh, court intrigue and marriages is, is a lot more permissible. Exactly. I, I, I absolutely agree with that. And um, so my point I wanted to make is um, all the freedoms today we enjoy, all the great things we enjoy from the West, all the technological advances, the scientific advances, all the political process we enjoy, we envy, I envy in the West because, you know, I, I also live in Rome and Rome back in the days used to be the America of the world, it used to rule the world. And uh, I'm going, I, I went to law school and in the, the first year, all you learn is Roman law and going back to Julius Caesar and the, to study the Republic of Rome, how it was constructed. And to say that, to see that, and it all developed in the West, I used to question why? Where does the, the the waste has gone? You know, it's, it's so advanced in many fields than the rest of the world. I mean, why is it the culture that the waste uh, encapsulates uh, dominates the world? Why is it the uh, the more the best things that we enjoy? You know, Apple, the iPhones, the the apps, the Facebook, the Instagrams, uh, the internet. Uh, Things that have changed humanity for the better have developed in the West. They didn't develop in the East. They didn't develop in South America. They didn't develop but, in but, Africa. And but I agree with you on some of these modern ones, and we need to acknowledge that. But let's yeah. remember the alphabet yeah. comes from the East. Numbers yeah. and math come from the East. Yeah, I'm not so saying that those basic building blocks are also there too. Exactly. If you see, I mean, I'm not saying that there is no contribution from the other part, the other side of the world. But if you see, if you see the America to its core, 
to its yes. core, America, to its core. I mean, America is the nation of immigrants, right? Everybody from the Caribbean to Africa, the Italians, you know, to the Europeans and the Scots, the Brits have immigrated. But the the core America, you see the the founding America, the the structures, the pillar that America rests on are those Anglo-Saxon values. There are, I mean, religion is Protestant, it's capitalism, it's freedom, it's individual uh, uh, liberty, and all these are encapsulated in the Anglo-Saxon culture. That is the core of America, right? And just uh, to finish my point, like, why is it, I, I, I was really fascinated and asked, I started to ask, why is it the most uh, Nobel Peace Prize, uh, the Nobel Science Prizes are won by Americans, well, even though they have immigrated uh, uh, in the past, somehow in the past in America, but they have the individuals have become American and they have they were able to win the, the Nobel Peace Prizes. Why is it that, that the most things that we enjoy today, we envy today, uh, are produced in the West? Why, why is it that the, the things we envy, the political system, the structures, uh, the medicine, the science, the technology, the engineering, uh, the architecture. Why is it that the the, the, um, the West was able to dominate things and then not the East, not Africa, and not South America? And my, I started to read a lot about these things, to research a lot about these things, uh, to watch a lot of videos about these things. I don't know, my, one of my favorite, uh, uh, mentors on this on these topics is David Hansen. He's a Hoover Hoover Institute associate. I don't know if you know if you know him. He lives also. I, in I don't know him, but I know the Hoover Institute. That's out of Stanford, right? Stanford. Yeah. He he is an associate there, and he writes a lot about uh, the roots of the West. You know, uh, why is it the West? Uh, why is it the West great? Why is the West was able to dominate the world? Not only in um, in culture and in the um, um, uh, in the in the economic aspect, but everybody wants to emigrate to the West. I mean, let's let's be honest. I mean, my parents, my parents, while we are in the Ethiopia, they didn't send me to a public Ethiopian school or to a private Ethiopian school. They went, they sent me to a Western school because they thought if you go to the West, you you will be able to grasp good ideas and for your future it will be it will be good. So my question is. Why is it the West had uh, was able to dominate? And my uh, my the answer I found was most of the the traditions uh, and the ideas that developed were rooted in Protestant Christianity. The, the my research gave me that uh, they were rooted they were rooted in Protestant Christianity. They were rooted in liberty, which uh, which the Protestant Christianity. Uh, encapsulates, you know, engulfs, gives you, it gives you the humus, the the atmosphere to develop it and to maximize freedom, and uh, that is why the West today dominates. That is my, I know it's a little bit uh, superficial, uh, superficial uh, way of reading the thing, but that is yeah, I think I think I think there is a lot of a lot of kernels of truth in what you're yeah. saying. But I have uh, just two kind of critiques on this. And then let's go into the origin story of you and your book, because I think it's so fascinating. And, and that's right. the better note that I think we're going to end on. I agree that those things played a large role. Again, I do yeah. have to point out the Catholicism of the Magna Carta and that kind of first beginning in the UK yeah. was Catholic before it was Anglican. And it's not until later that it becomes lower church. I would also point to, for me, the Austrian economic tradition exactly. is the tradition of economic analysis that I think actually gave birth to the kind of the, the greatest liberation, the greatest arguments against socialism. And mm -hmm. the, these people were all secular Jews. You, you talk about people like Ludwig von Mises, people mm -hmm. like Frederick Hayek who's mm -hmm. uh, again, uh, Austrian Jewish yeah. economist who won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1973. And his teacher was Ludwig von Mises. People like Murray, Murray Rothbard, who, who later extended that analysis as an American uh, Jewish person. And, and so there's contact between, I think, the Catholic tradition, the, yeah. the Jewish, the European Jewish tradition, the Protestant tradition. And I think all of those things contributed to what you would refer in Twitter, you also refer to this Protestant work ethic, which I yeah. think is a part of the situation. I, I would, uh, hold on, where is it? 
I would recommend to you this book. Uh, look oh. at that beautiful American flag. I'm also wearing American flag colors. It's exactly. called A Renegade History of the United States by Thaddeus Russell. He's an American historian, and he talks about the interplay between that American Protestant tradition you speak of, who are mm -hmm. the, the Puritans, and then yeah. the people who they fought against, who are the renegades, who at yeah. various times in their later immigration, the Italians, yeah. the Jews, and the Irish were considered Negroes and other things. They were considered other from the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant tradition, and then they later assimilated. But at various times, uh, them along with gays, along with blacks, along with Protestants have, have been in tension with each other, and that yeah. tension is what produced the American system. Not just the Puritans by themselves, but the, exactly. the interplay between them. You know, there, there are crazy stories, for example, of like Rhode Island people running naked through Puritan churches just to harass the Puritans in their settlement. And then they would go back and some of these people are, are flogged. Some of them are put to death. Some of them escape. But but it's this, it's this longer tradition and all of these, these tensions. And I think there's great value in, in, in that I also yeah. think, though, there's some value in in some of the other places in the East, and and I highlight that. And I I like to think of myself as some amalgamation, some some admixture of the yeah. West and and of the East. And I think it doesn't need to be one or the other, but we need mm -hmm. to examine them honestly, like like you are attempting to examine them, and hold yeah. on to to all of the the good things. So so let's. I think we've gotten to a good point of of at least yeah. somewhat agreement on these Western values that I think we do yeah. both share and, and yeah. some of the Eastern ones that we were raised on. Tell yeah. us if we can rewind the clock. You told us a little bit, but tell us how you grew up in Addis Ababa. What was the nature of that school and, and how you got to, to law yeah. school and to learn all these languages and history? Awesome. So I was born in Addis, Addis Ababa, Anatoly Chadakut, and my parents, you know, they're they're very good Christian people. They're very, they are, they're very God fearing. You know, since we were we were children, they they set good example for us. So, uh, born born and raised in Andes, they they uh, my parents wanted to invest in my education so dearly, so they sent me to this great school, this is an international school. And you know, Andes is a, is a diplomatic hub of the African continent, and there are a lot of you know, international institutions, and there are a lot of diplomats that want to send their children to, to the My grandmother country. lived in an old airport neighborhood, so they were near a lot of those diplomats. Exactly. That was the, that was, that was the, the neighborhood that usually people dwelt in. So they sent me to this, to this Italian, to this European Italian school in, in Andes, and from kindergarten to high school, I did like the... Um, I was brought up in this curriculum. We did the same curriculum, the European curriculum that they stated here in, in Europe and Italy. So the, the funny thing is, I, I started, first I started to speak Italian, then I learned while I was in the fifth grade and fourth grade, I started to learn Amharic. I mean, that's like, that is like the dilemma in Ethiopia. Did you, did you learn Amharic formally in school or just through speaking oh. with your parents and others? Back home, my parents, you know, they had like a teacher, so and he come and he would taught he who would teach me Amharic and like a uh, private tutor or actually a part of the Italian school. No, no, a private tutor, a private tutor. In the Italian school, we didn't have any Amharic subject. We only have the European language. So, so we we study Italian, French, and then after when I started the uh, high school, we studied Latin and classical Greek, and we studied Benissimo. all the. Bellissimo, molto bello. <laughs> in fact, my Italian, usually when people here in Italy see me speak Italian, they're like shocked. I mean, because <laughs> I'm black and they're not usually, you know, they don't see black people that are very fluent in Italian. So they're like, the, the first reaction is very, uh, I laugh I laugh about it every time. It's very, it's very surprising. So Do they the ask you if you're like half Italian or something? <laughs> Like, were you born in Rome? And when you born, were you born and raised here? And I'm like, no, I was born in Ethiopia, and I have to go to the, every time to tell the story. I was born in Ethiopia, and my parents sent me to an Italian school, so that's why I'm very fluent in Italian and everything. You but, should print it on a note card, and when they ask you, just give them the note card. <laughs> it's very, it's very easy that way. But going to that school has opened a lot of doors for me, and. First, it, it was great because for my academic upgrade, upgrading, it, because uh, in Ethiopia, you know, to have a good, to have an, a good education, I know you have trouble to, 
travel back and home from uh, to Ethiopia to the US, it's very, uh, it's very, it's very scared. It's very uh, scarce to have a good institution where you, 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 your children can have a good education. And my teachers were were all from Italy. They came with uh, like the best teachers came because they, they used to send us through the, they had to pass an exam and, uh, and everything and they have to, to come to teach us. And growing up in that culture, in that Italian culture, in that Italian way of thinking and uh, um, growing up learning Italian literature and French literature, all the, the things I, that I admire today made me who I am. It's my, today is part of my identity. And uh, and also I was like a, a nerdy ass kid when I was back back back, back to school. I was I was uh, I was like always first of my class. Used to to be a huge um, um, uh, um, you know I I I gave a huge to huge aspect to my academic life. And when I was fifth uh, when I was fifteen. I was like in junior high in a high school. Uh, I had the opportunity to start to work for the Italian embassy and uh, military attaché office. There's like a department, uh, the military attaché office, and they needed some interpreter that they would interpret them from Amharic to Italian, from English to Italian, from Italian to Amharic and English. And uh, that's another area of crossover we have. Although I was not professional by that age, I didn't become a professional interpreter until much later. But I've been yeah. interpreting since around that age too. So that's beautiful. Yeah, exactly. And I started to make some some money. Also, <laughs> I mean, at fifteen, I was making, I was I was. It made me become independent of uh, out of my parents. So I started to work there. Was when I was fifteen. So in the weekdays from Monday to Friday, I go to school. I. Uh, I leave school at three o'clock, then go home right away. Four o'clock, I punched in and finished my my work at the embassy at like seven seven in the evening, and get back home and do my homework, study a little bit, then go back. So it made me become an adult from the from the early every days of my of my teen years. Let's say like 15, 16, I was like already independent adult on my own, studying, you know, living life on my own and. Uh, no. And it was an awesome experience, and uh, I did it. Uh, we 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 studied we studied like in high school. Usually in American in Ethiopia is four years, but uh, our high school system is like five years. So I did five years of high school, then I graduated from high school, and that upgraded me, and I became the personal assistant of the Italian ambassador. I worked for two two years as a, as his personal assistant, and I was like twenty one. And they offered me a full scholarship to come to. to wait, Rome. wait. Let, let's let's pause there. What's interesting about that is, you're not yeah. an Italian citizen, right? Like you were an Ethiopian citizen at the time. Still, I'm an Ethiopian citizen. Still, Ethiopian citizen, and you don't have to be an Italian citizen to work as the personal wow. assistant of the ambassador of Italy to Ethiopia. Because they're locally employed, so they they're looking like for the best persons and. Uh, you know, to to call for someone to come from Italy to be the assistant. If they can find someone that speaks Italian and speaks Amharic and speaks English, I mean, it was the it was a win win situation for them. So they they assumed it, and I worked for two years as his personal assistant. And uh, when he finished his mandate, he said, uh, because I I worked for five years for the Italian government, they have these yeah. weird laws that if you if you have uh, if you have worked if you have given your service for the Italian state for five years, you can ask for some benefits from the from the Italian state. And given That's that, so I, amazing. Like, yeah, and given that was I was young, and they gave me this full scholarship, and uh, I came home to. Uh, it's a huge university here in here in Rome, and uh, I started. I went to law school. Now I'm uh, on a on a on a road to become a prosecutor in Italy. If one day I become an Italian citizen, and uh, that's it. Do they do they allow dual, or would you have to give up your Ethiopian citizenship? Well, in the, in the Italy, we they are allowed dual citizenship by law. They do. Have, well, so I see a lot of. Americans that have come to work, to live in Italy, and this, when they become citizens, they still can keep their American citizens. Oh, but so I know between American, I didn't, I didn't know about Ethiopia because I know America and Ethiopia they don't have that. I wish, I wish they had it. If they had it, you know, I, I would have. Yeah. So you're an American citizen, by because I'm you're American. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You can be. No, they, 
even the Ethiopian system doesn't allow it because it is a more a political decision than a practical decision. You have to, if you have to give, a, you, if you have to take another decision, you have to give up your Ethiopian citizenship, which is for me a weird thing. A weird thing. Yeah, I don't and, like that. Yeah, I don't like that too. And no, and um, home, left home when I was twenty-one, came to Rome, and started this university and. Uh, um, during my university work, I, I, I also work and I founded the first black rent journal uh, newspaper in Italy. It's called Black Post. <laughs> we made history on that. And uh, it's the first, I'm the editor in chief. And in, it's the what, first. What is the theme or what, what do you cover? Politics, culture, daily affair. Uh, we comment on things that happen. Uh, and what's the, the name? Let's, let's plug it as well. What's the name of this? www.blackpost.it is uh, black post i mean it's the information given from the black guy from my perspective as a black person to the italian side which is a white one and yeah. uh, and in 2018 i ran from local elections 2018 two years ago and i was uh, also elected to serve on the on the regional uh, which is a local election on the regional uh, council you know, it's like, um, you know, in the United States, you have states. So, you know, America is mm -hmm. from in Italy. We have regions, and those regions are subdivided in administrative uh, provinces and cities. And uh, the region where I live, the Rome, is called Lazio region. And I run for the, the, the Italian Democratic Party, which is a liberal party and a center, a center left party. And in 2018, I uh, ran. And I also made history on that, being the first black person ever elected in the Italian history in the uh, in the history of uh, Regione That's Latte. crazy. So yeah, the people have to understand that the word liberal is used differently in Europe exactly. than in the United States. Well, the European, yeah, exactly. It's very different from... Uh, it's, a cla the, it's a classical liberalism and what I would well, call ed ed etymological. Ed etymological, because uh, li liberalismo is a freedom, it's liberty. Exactly, exactly. It's a center left, it's a liberal party, the Italian Democratic Party. In 20, it's a it's a local election by law. Everybody, if you are regular regularly reside, you can you can participate in that. And uh, I was elected in the, into legislators, and uh, it's for five years, 2018, two years I've been uh, serving. So you're working, you're currently in that position. In the, yeah, currently in that legislature. Running the black post. While running the black post, while going to college uh, to graduate school to become prosecutor, and while working at the same time for an American law firm, the DLA Piper, I work also for the wow. an American, as a as an assistant for as a translator assistant, uh, part time, part time work, part time on the for that. That's incredible, man. That's incredible. And, and then you also authored a book. Tell tell us about the book that you authored. This is my book. I don't know if you can see it. It's so yes, cool. it says uh, M I G generation. Exactly. And I can't see the third line. Yeah, it's a la banda del pack. It's an Italian. It says la banda del pack post si racconta preparazione da vita soli. You see, my Italian is better than my English. I mean, my Italian is fluent. <laughs> molto bene, molto bene. Molto bello, molto bello. It's a it's a book I wrote like last year. Last year I decided to to write a book. Uh, because um, since I came to Italy, I really, I was like on an adventure to discover my identity, my Ethiopianness. And uh, because, because a lot of, we have a lot of history we share with Italy. And uh, there were the wars. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Two big wars. And we made ourselves during those wars. I mean, at Adwa, which is the, like the, the, the festivity I like about Ethiopia is where we, we identify our Ethiopianness, where, where we identify who we are as people. And that's like a huge thing. I mean, we were never colonized. And uh, uh, I mean, that's like for me, when I was in Ethiopia, I, I, I wouldn't really relate it to it, even though I have like an Italian professors, I see the difference. But when you come in the West and you see yourself, I really started to discover myself, who I am. And did they living... discuss it, by the way? Sorry to interrupt. Did, did, no, when you no. grew up in the high school, did yeah. the Italians, did they talk about King Umberto and Mussolini and their invasions of Ethiopia? 
we had like a whole history class where we discuss and I was the fifth one and I was like we in Italian we say we abbiamo fatto un culo it's a it's a way of saying we we <laughs> The Russian children are like an actual. It's an Italian way to say. But our history class, I remember, yeah. was my. In was Spanish, like, that word uh, refers to the rear end. <laughs> I don't yeah, know if it's the same. Exactly. That 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 is in Italian too. That refers to the rear end. Mismo. <laughs> exactly. We have both the. No, during the my history classes, my professors, it was like wrestling with me. I mean, I was very proud to be in the. That to have that national um, national sentiment in me to have that national identity and it was and it's also unique. I'm, I mean, I don't know if you if you noticed in America in America you're, you're like, but here in Europe I really see it, our differences in values how we how we see and we Ethiopians are very high monotonous Western, very exaggerated less Western. Uh, and they are more atheist than I get not sure, even though they are Catholic. That's why I said I don't care about the labels. That's why, because when you start to living in this in this society, you see the people's what they value. And that legal touch. And I really was on an adventure to find myself who I am, my identity, what it means to be Ethiopian. It took only and my and the and the struggle I had between these two identities because. What they come along, I'm, I'm going to an Italian school and the Italian culture is part of my identity because I speak fluent Italian, I grew up learning Italian history, I grew up learning European history, but also I have that side in me of my Ethiopia witness, no? Where uh, where I go to my community, where my where, uh, when I go to church, I found the fellowship with others, my parents, the way of living we have in Ethiopia. And, then, and these two identities always were in tension between them. And I see, and I, I, I say to myself, I am, I am like, I'm a product that is, that is, uh, that, that's related to tension of if I thought product and being a muscle. I mean, one side, the European Italian side, and the Ethiopian, in the Ethiopian side, in one hand, and these two, these two identities in me where they were fighting because in the, my Ethiopian side, I have Adwa and Ailas Las, I had Seminilik Manam Machem Yal Tagazan. Uh, I mean, I mean, we are the symbol of freedom for black people and everything. And my Italian side, I have the culture, the food I love, the pizza, the pasta, the carbonara, the language I love, the everything I love about the Italian European identity. And this identity started a little bit to fight in me. I was like, am I Italian 100% or am I an Ethiopian 100%? What is it? What? No matter to know. Is it uh, what does it mean to be Ethiopian? And um, I grew up in these two identities and that's what I talk about uh, in the book. And uh, um, I don't know I mean, it's a unique, I don't know if you have noticed it, Gil. Ethiopian, we have a unique culture. We have a, I mean, a unique identity that has to be preserved. It's not like something we inherited uh, just like that. I mean, people no, pay It's nothing price. to be neglected. Exactly. And growing up in this in this uh, international community school, I see a lot of my peers that are a little bit ashamed of them being Ethiopian. You know, they're they're more they they focus on more on the Western side of uh, of their identity, and they don't speak Amharic correctly. blow, you know, diaspora Yeah, I think I think your parents hiring that private tutor to teach you Amharic is very different. I spoke on this show. Uh, a while back about a a gentleman known as uh, Alaka Asras. And Alaka Asras, he yeah. saw this before the communists took over. And yeah. he critiqued the over-modernization of mm. the schools. He thinks it's, it's, it's proper to modernize because we have to match the scientific okay. feats, for example, that you mentioned earlier. But yeah. he was concerned that this over-modernization was happening at the expense of Ethiopia. So imagine, yeah. for example... If the Italian school you went to was mm -hmm. required to teach Amharic mm -hmm. and then had Gz alongside those European languages. So let's say you had the option to do Italian and Gz. 
or yeah, Italian I'm... Amharic and Guz or Italian Amharic and Oromina or you know what I mean? Like, like the fact that you only in the school setting have foreign languages, I think, like you said, prepares you to basically to become highly educated and yeah. become part of the brain drain, like leave the country highly educated. And exactly. my kind of seeing it through Alec Asras and others who've commented on this, this trend yeah. Yeah. is what raises in me the desire to learn yeah. Guz more, to learn Amharic more, and to eventually want to return to Ethiopia. If I can't fully, then at least on some sort of part-time basis, like growing up, I used to go every year for a certain amount of years. Um, so, it, you know, every summer you went like to Ethiopia. and uh, For so a good five, seven years in a row, I did that. Like, so it was like, for you, it was like discovering your roots. That's something, that was something like Obama talked about when he was growing up. He went to Kenya to visit his parents because he was brought up in this white Anglo-Saxon European, European identity. And he wanted to find out his Africa roots. And I don't know if you read Dream from, Dreams from My Father. He talks about... I did not. Uh, yeah, he talks about finding his African roots and he went to Africa to discover about his parents, his father's side and everything. For you, so for you, it's something like that. I mean, it's like you grew up in that American culture and said, I have an Ethiopian side too, so I have to go back and see. And, and say for me, it's like I was born and brought up in that Ethiopian culture, but I was Westernized because I went to an Italian, Italian school and all they do, they did was feed me their culture, their language, their thing. And at some point, my, I mean, I usually now I don't even like when you think I don't I don't know in what language you think, but I think in Italian. I mean, when I do calculation maths or something, the numbers I use in my mind are not Amharic or English; they're Italian. I mean, I think I'm, in English mostly, but there are times when I think in Amharic, especially when there would be periods in Ethiopia where I'd go, where I'd go a week without speaking English. You know, oh. and then I would begin, you know, occasionally I have dreams in Amharic and occasionally I think there are certain things, for example, in the household, yeah, chulfa comes to me quicker yeah. than ladle. Ladle mm. is like an effort to say ladle. Chulfa, yeah. Muz comes to me before banana. Bar comes to me before door. So there are yeah. certain things, especially like emotions, like yeah. whether it's deep anger or it's yeah. deep sadness or those kind of like visceral reactions come to yeah. me more in Amharic and the philosophical stuff comes yeah. to me more in English, if I'm just yeah. being honest. Yeah. However, yeah. as I've spent the past nine years, you know, praying in Guz, uh, yeah. that, that influence is, is kind of swaying. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 a, it's an amalgamation. Do, do you, have you ever dreamed in, in Amharic or is there any part of you that is more Amharic than Italian? It's usually or it's in English or it's in Italian. If I dream, most of for example, my how, how do Italians say your name? Are they able to pronounce it correctly? Yeah. Uh, Sophonias derives from the Greek word Sophonia, which is which is in classical Greek. He was also a, like a huge philosopher back in his days. Even yes. though my parents chose the word from the Bible to give me because he was a Jewish uh, prophet. Zephaniah in, in English, Zephaniah. Yeah. So, in a market so far is so it's not a problem but and also, casa on work casa on work they, they stumble on that one usually when i'm uh, when i'm at the university and the professor calls me he's like so for us and he, he makes that <laughs> he makes that weird weird yeah see and you, know, you have to or six years you, you you're you already got it passed to it but that is also what i what i talk about in my books i mean haynock alias I mean, these are Ethiopian names. I mean, if you go to most, but Africa, biblical too, biblical too. So <laughs> mine's a little more. You have to exactly. go to my grandpa Nagash to get Amharic. To get Amharic, but they are like our identity is rooted in that Judeo-Christian values yes. I told you that formed our culture because culture at the end of the day is downstream of religion. Every com com everything comes from religion. So like our culture derives from that Judeo. And I'm so grateful for that because we we're able to maintain our uniqueness. Because if you go to most African countries, his, his name is either Richard or uh, uh, you know uh, Stephen, or because they were quote unquote they were colonized. You know they they were not. Yeah, I don't like to put people down like this, but I remember there was one uh, Ghanaian American friend of yeah. mine, 
And yeah. he tried to have an argument about what the best African country was. And I just looked at him and I said, remind yeah. me, what language is it? That I didn't even go to the fact that the Ghanaian flag is copying the Ethiopian green, yellow, red. But I said, remind me, what language is it that you speak over there? And he yeah. said, English. And I was like, okay, thank you. And I just walked away. I didn't even get it. I just walked away. And he's like, oh, like, fuck, that's messed up. <laughs> like, that is like your mic drop scene. <laughs> exactly. Uh, no, me too. I, I'm not like putting, putting, putting people down, but... I was like, I was, I was told, I was in this endeavor to, re, to rediscover my identity, who I am, and uh, and that's what I talk about in this book. I mean, uh, growing up in that Italian Ethiopian culture, the history when the Italians came to colonize us, but we were able to defeat them twice, and uh, with Mussolini and everything, and uh, and me growing up. At the end, at the end of the day, then we made peace. And they opened their schools, and um, the emperor was very, was very high on uh, you know modernizing Ethiopia. So he needed hands, so he opened a lot of you know Lise Garamariam, the English, the Sanford, the our school, the Greek ones, the American, the ISIS ones, because he wanted to. He used also to send a lot of young people to to the West to study with scholarship and everything. And the be the beautiful thing is, they used to come back after they finish. They came back to Ethiopia. That's true. Exactly. I mean, while I, while I was uh, until writing, the communists, yeah, until until the garden communists. But while uh, while uh, while I was writing my book, I discovered that you know the the our two prime ministers that served under the emperor were like a Harvard grad and an Oxford grad. I, I don't know if you knew that. And that was like I, I I didn't know about them, but I know people, yeah. for example, like uh, Professor Emeritus Efrem Isak who came yeah. in the 50s and was the first black man to teach at Harvard, you know? Yeah. And he's still here, but he's gone back, you know, several times. I know people like Professor Asmarom Lagasa, who, who's an Eritrean who wrote about the Oromo, who was one yeah. of those early people that the emperor sent out and, you know, who came back and was doing research. And exactly. um, yeah, the, com the communist upheaval and then later the federal democracy we have now, those yeah. two upheavals made Ethiopia less cosmopolitan because when our grandparents and even our parents grew up, you had yeah. Turkish people, Greek people, Armenian people, Somali people, so many different ethnicities I, I, and groups who, yeah. who came to the stability that was there during the monarchy. Exactly. And that is what I, I talk about my, uh, in my book. And uh, I was fortunate enough the current president of the European Parliament, his name is David Sassoli, as he saw it here, and he read my copy, he read, I gave him, I sent him a hard copy just to uh, to to see what he think about it. Smart about man, smart yeah. man, you shot your shot. And he read it and he was so fascinated, he said, you are an Ethiopian, an African who came to Italy, speak fluent Italian, and you already wrote a book in Italian? And he was so <laughs> fascinated about that. And uh, he read it and he said, I want to write the foreword for the book. And uh, he wrote the foreword for the book and it ended up having a huge success. I was invited twice in the Italian Senate in the Italian House of Representatives to present the books to talk about my book and the history we had and the legacy of fascism that uh, that Italy had in Ethiopia. And I discussed it with uh, lawmakers, Italian lawmakers, Lawmakers invited me to the Italian chamber, to the Italian parliament. And uh, we did two events on that. And uh, I sold tons of copies and made a lot of money about it also. <laughs> sold a lot of, and the Italians. And Quan, and Quan de Sale, the, I, I'm, I'm waiting on either an Amharic or English translation. If it doesn't come soon enough, I'm going to have to take my Duolingo out and pick up Italian because it's not too different from Espanol. I could see we could understand each other a little bit in our, our little side mini comments. Sometimes I'm guessing what would be the Italian word. So you, you tell me whether you do Amharic first or English or or tell me if I have to learn Italian. No, it's it's on its way as 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 soon as possible, but I'm working on it. I'm working on it. I mean, I think English would be the first one because I'm hard to write it for me. And I'm hard it's, it's gonna be a little bit. It's gonna be a little bit hard. So I think the English version will come will come first. And I'm gonna send you a copy, an honor copy to my with a with a personal dedication. So don't worry about it. I'm a second allo. Grazie. Yeah, but just to finalize on the book. I mean, and when I wrote the book and um, I talk about what it means for me to be Ethiopian and. And when I came to Europe, I really discovered what it means to be, 
What I mean, the patrimony that our forefathers left us, a country that was never colonized with our unique culture, our unique language, our unique, I mean, we're special. Our, our, our plate, I, 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 I take a lot of my Italian friends to eat Ethiopian food, and the minute they say food in their restaurant, they're like, wow, because they see the, <laughs> the culture and the paintings and, you know, that classical thing of Lalibela you, you will find in every Ethiopian restaurant, and the music you, you listen, the... I mean, I, I just say we are unique people, Ethiopians, and uh, we're not like some. I mean, um, America is formed with immigrants. And, you know, everybody you know, there are the there are the descendants of slaves. There are the immigrants who came from Europe, and uh, everybody just you know put in what they have, and they from the, this melting pot at the end of the day. But our Ethiopianness is very something for me special. I mean, and uh, and it it has to be like. And it was like given to us, not because they were, uh, um, I mean, people gave their blood to preserve that culture, that uniqueness we have. And, uh, and I just, I don't, I, 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 can't, I really can't find the right words to describe my feelings I have. I, I'm that hyper-nationalism identity uh, in me now, so it's close. And, and I was fascinated the values I had when uh, when I came to Europe and I see my peers in Europe. Then um, I mean I see very I'm very different than them. And and I will, I always ask. Last year taken about I mean they are always like smoking, drinking, and going to clubs. And and here I am an immigrant that came from from a third world country. Like I founded my first newspaper that is run by black uh, by black. I, I I have a good job. I'm a I'm I'm like an elite graduate school i'm a, i'm on road to become a prosecutor i have a dream i mean i have certain values and i see i see that in the italians i don't not gonna so sad show i mean we're very different and, and i don't mean this, this to exaggerate but sometimes I'm, i find myself a little bit to be i don't know a little bit better quote unquote to on my on my on my lifestyle <laughs> <laughs> no, really. And I, I, you know, I mean, I really like I won for elections and I was elected and and I say, what? I, I don't see it in the, in the other African immigrants that are here. I mean, I, I'm not like trying to put them down, but I don't see it. They don't have that, um, I don't know, the feeling, the fire that just let them go. And uh, in the book, I come to the conclusion it was... First, it's because we never we were never colonized. We were able to defend our our national identity, and uh, and I, I pay a huge respect to our forefathers who were Adwale Lord Mussolini, Bagazla Huge respect for that. And second, I come to the conclusion is because our culture is God centered. We have that religion, Judeo Christian values. We have something right and wrong. We know something. You know, Ethiopians are not that that hype on LGBT rights. It's because because we have a sense of what is right and what is wrong. Society, not only only on the individual level. The more of the time, the more we have something that we share everybody, like uh, uh, a sentiment we have that is wrong, that is right. The culture we have that is rooted in. In the Bible, in uh, around religion, and the Ethiopian Orthodox Church played a huge role in, in influencing people, and uh, we were able to maintain it till till to this day. That was like the first thing I saw when you when you were like a deacon and you spoke with Ethan. I was like fascinated. I mean, he was like a young lad born and raised in LA. Like LA is like I don't know people in the West because they're like the crazy Hollywood. City. And he is a deacon, a Christian, an Orthodox Christian. He, he he wants to find his roots, and uh, he serves God daily, and he he lives, I'm sure, by godly principles. I was like fascinated, and because I don't see that commonly mainstream in the Ethiopian in the Ethiopian news. No? There's a there's a there's a growing number. I would still admit it's a minority, but if we talk about people who grew up like me in my situation, there are yeah. probably seventy to a hundred of us, you know in LA and maybe moved elsewhere. And, 
and yeah. maybe maybe three to five of us, you know, are on a similar path. But there is a, a movement across the United States, especially through the internet, through social media. More of us people who are who are driven, like you said, by godly values, are being able to link up. And the kind of main thrust of your book, although I have not read it, and I look forward to yeah. to reading it one day and and reviewing it for you as well to keep to keep the the publicity train going, is that. The, these kind of the the intersection of two worlds for me it's the united states and ethiopia for you it's it's italy and yeah. ethiopia and again even though you were born in ethiopia you're in an in a sort of sub bubble that was yeah. italian and so we have a lot of commonalities there and and your love of languages and and pursuit yeah. of of religion and politics the two topics that they say not to talk about at dinner parties are the ones that fascinate you and i yeah. the most and uh, i hope yeah. uh, i think you're a little younger than me but i hope to uh, be a, a published author like you one day too i got some some projects in the in the work that that you may like to one day and I, yeah. I thank you thank you so much for for thank your you. time today grazie so it was an honor thank you for having me i mean i was really blessed by it and uh, keep up the good work i saw some of your as i told you and then video i was like fascinated i mean your your knowledge of ethiopian history and the ethiopian church and uh, uh, even though I'm not an Orthodox, I really appreciate. I'm thankful for God we have the the institution of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, and it is uh, it is vital to maintain it. The fire. The more generations I see, uh, we need to to keep intact to them. We we need to keep that fire because um, the day we lose we lose that Judeo Christian heritage in Ethiopia is the day we lose Ethiopia. I think that. <inaudible> Yeah, it is that. Uh, that is what I think. And I see most people, young people today, they are not that 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 fired up about Ethiopia. No, uh, we really need to. If we if we need to influence the generation with, with this kind of podcasts, count me in. I mean it. So and thank you for. I think I think that we are able to to act yeah. as muses to in, inspire the generation. Yeah. So thank you again for participating, fratello. Ciao. Grazie mille, caro amico, caro fratello. Ti ringrazio. That is my time. That I told you, my time is way better than my American <laughs> name. To be honest, but it was an honor. Grazie, è stato veramente un piacere. Grazie, grazie mille, guarda.